Likewise, Manetti often relied on Bruni as a source of information for most of his own works on various subjects, from translation theory to philosophy. Manetti's history of Pistoia is no exception. This bears important consequences also from a philological point of view. Knowing a humanist source can prove most helpful to fix a corrupt passage when the extant witnesses do not preserve the original formula or if the damage already occurred in the archetype itself. I would like to show an example from Manetti's Historia Pistoriensis. In Book 2, paragraph 161, Manetti describes the Florentine conquest of Artimino, a castle in the Tuscan countryside. The source is certainly the account of this same episode in Bruni's Historia Florentini Populi, as the language reveals. Yet, Manetti's account, as transmitted by all seven extant manuscripts, is corrupt, as one can see by reading the following. Florentini, in agrum pristoriensem ingrediuntur, quod licet abopidanis egregia atmodum defenderetur, ad extremum tamen in columes abire pacti, castellum dedidere. The English translation reads as follows. The Florentines enter the territory of Pistoia, that although very well defended by the locals, in the end they surrendered the castles, having been allowed to leave without suffering any harm. The syntax is indeed awkward, suggesting that something must be wrong or missing. I'd like to pause for a moment here before discussing the specific case in greater detail and take this opportunity to encourage you always to translate the text you're editing. The risk with a mere recensio, a collation and assessment of all the exemplars, unaccompanied by a version in your own language, is that your mind, ears and eyes get used to the text after a while, to the point that its prose or poetry soon starts sounding like a mantra, a sort of formula that puts you in a trance-like state. Inevitably, and often without noticing, your breathing and heartbeat change when you read manuscripts, just as if you were practicing yoga. Comparing the copy in front of you with the reference text becomes like a sort of silent liturgy, a psalm that you recite to yourself. This ritual, so to speak, only gets interrupted when a discrepancy catches your attention. It's difficult to keep the necessary level of alertness throughout so as to notice every single variant. It may even happen that philologists read the same corrupt passage many times over without ever realizing that there is something wrong with them, especially if the meaning is not hard to grasp. In this regard, translating can render a great service. By transferring that text into your own language, you have to put yourself in the author's shoes, as it were. If I may add another similar metaphor, when translating you must follow in his or her footsteps. In doing so, it's a lot easier for you to see if the author or the tradition of his text has stumbled. All right, and now enough with this digression, though important on the need to translate any text you're editing, whether you intend to publish that translation or not. Back to the example I started giving about a passage in Manetti's History of Pistoia. It is probably better to cite this excerpt again, so as to refresh our memory. In Latin, Florentini, in agrum pistoriensem ingrediuntur, quod licet abopidanis egregia admonum defenderetur, ad extremum tamen in colume sabire pacti castellum dedidere. Apart from the awkward syntax, which one could try to justify as a rhetorical anacoluton, although that would not be consistent with Manetti's style, especially in a page like this, the main thing is that too many things do not seem to work in this apparently simple sentence. First, the neutral pronoun quod cannot go with the preceding masculine noun, agrum. Second, Manetti uses the word opidani, but it does not mention any opidum after agrum. Opidum would make perfect sense also because of its gender, neutral, that could go with the pronoun quod. There is, however, a neutral noun in this sentence that the quod could refer to. It's castellum, mentioned at the end. Thanks to these elements, one could divine a plausible correction. But even closer at hand, and more reliable, is the source of this passage, Bruni's History of the Florentine People. The corresponding account in Bruni's History of the Florentine People, Book 5, Paragraph 127, reads as follows. Florentini agrum pistoriensem ingressi, arteminum obsederunt. Id quoque castellum per ea tempora munitissimum erat, aliquot dies circa illud comorati tandem incredibile virtute espugnare ad orti sunt. Cum egregia resisteretur, ingenti materie vi circa muros congesta incensaque, vallum simul portaque crematur. 
neque die, neque noctu, o pugnazione intermissa, qui intus erant, desperatis, ad extremum rebus, in colume sabire pacti, castellum de didere. In an English literal translation, this passage would read as follows. The Florentines entered the territory of Pistoia and besieged Artimino. This castle happened to be very well fortified. After spending several days in the area, they finally started storming the castle most forcefully. Since the besieged resisted strenuously, they amassed a lot of materials by the walls, set fire to them, and burned both the ditch and the gate. The siege continued night and day. In the end, the besieged, being desperate, surrendered the castle, having been allowed to leave without suffering any harm. I believe it is precisely the section in italics quoted above that was left out, that is dropped, from Annette's reworking of this passage. The omission occurred in the archetype, and from there it trickled down into all the extant witnesses. None of the scribes responsible for copying this work, not even the one who transcribed the manuscript of the Historia Pistoriensis for Manetti's own library, what is now Codex Palatinus Latinus 932 at the Vatican Library, noticed this omission. This copy corresponds to manuscript V in the critical edition, whose stemma codicum is as follows. Not even the author himself, Manetti, found anything wrong with this passage, although, as we shall see in the next section, it is likely that he intervened to insert some various in copies, now lost, that is, so-called codices interpositi, of the Historia Pistoriensis. This, however, should not surprise us. Though a privileged reader, an author is still a reader of his own text. As such, he may fail to detect shortcomings in what he wrote months or years earlier, especially if he does not intend to carry out a meticulous reworking, like a brand new edition, in which case the structure too will most likely undergo a significant change. Nor does an author, when intervening on his own text at a later stage, always opt for a lexio difficilior, that is, a more difficult variant. Authors may also trivialize their own text, that is, simplify it, either intentionally or because of carelessness. This, however, pertains to the so-called critique of variants that I will discuss in the next section. Let us now return to the example I was giving a minute ago. To the best of my knowledge, only one reader realized that this passage was corrupt, the 18th century Italian scholar Ludovico Antonio Muratori, who published this work on the basis of one single manuscript in 1731. In his edition for the famous series Rerum Italicarum Scriptores, Muratori inserted three dots to signal an omission right after In Agrum Pistoriensum Ingrediuntur. Not bothering to offer a critical edition, Muratori avoided checking this paragraph against other witnesses or conjecturing an emendation. When working on the Historia Pistoriensis a few years ago, instead, I had to intervene after collating all extant manuscripts, since my task was precisely to come up with a critical edition. I thus opted for a minimal intervention, borrowing as little as possible from the identified source, again, Bruni's Historia Florentini Populi, precisely the excerpt in Latin quoted above. Since the extant materials did not allow for a larger, say, more invasive intervention, and considering that parsimony is always a good principle in philology when one has to intervene on the text, I simply replaced the verb ingrediuntur in the extant copies of Manetti's Historia Pistoriensis with the past participle ingressi, followed by the formula artiminum obsederunt, they besieged artimino, as one finds in Bruni. This way, the syntax makes sense, for artiminum is connected with the neutral pronoun quod immediately following. In its restored form, the passage reads as follows. Et agum pristoriensem ingressi artiminum obsederunt, quod licet ad opidanis e grecia atmodum defenderetur ad extremum tamen in columes abire pacti castellum de didere. The angle brackets in the body of the text show that those two words, artiminum obsederunt, have been added by the editor. This philological issue is discussed in detail in the introduction to the edition, precisely pages 81-82, discussing the archetype, and then again in pages 87-88, where I explain the editorial principles that I have followed. Finally, in the apparatus to this passage, the conjecture is highlighted by means of simple philological formulas, in Latin, as tradition dictates, reading as follows. Speaking of tradition and all the meanings of this word, it's now time to move on to the next section, 
where I will talk, though briefly, of the following subjects, all of which have already been hinted at in this video. The issue of authorial variance, the use of marginal notes, and issues of punctuation when working on humanist texts.